tonight we're going to put to bed any mystery of exactly what is happening. Certainly for anyone who is involved in any legal cases or is looking to get involved, I think this is something that you may want to send to your legal counsel. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Mark is here with you for Arcadia Economics. And tonight, a video that personally I think is one of the most important ones that I have made and shared, particularly because, well, you've heard about is the silver market manipulated for years? And then, of course, there was the Bart Chilton interview and then the Deutsche Bank case and then the JP Morgan settlement. So, certainly a lot of evidence. But my goal tonight is that I'm going to show you how it occurs because I think that's important. Again, we see the counterintuitive price movement on the charts on a day to day basis and it looks unnatural. But tonight, we're going to put to bed any mystery of exactly what is happening. Certainly for anyone who is involved in any legal cases or is looking to get involved, I think this is something that you may want to send to your legal counsel. I was having some meetings with different lawyers or legal advocates this morning, so we'll be spearheading something here as well, which I'll have more information about as we get a little closer. But tonight I want to show exactly how at least one portion of the price manipulation in silver occurs. By all means, that does not mean that there are not more. But with that said, let us dig in. So to begin, I think it's going to be important to understand what a stop order is or a stop loss order. I'll be referring to it as a stop because that is a big part of our story tonight. Here on Investopedia, you can see a stop loss order is an order placed with a broker to buy or sell a specific stock once the stock reaches a certain price. For example, setting a stop loss order for 10% below the price at which you bought the stock will limit your loss to 10%. Suppose you purchase Microsoft at $20 per share. Right after buying the stock, you entered a stop loss order of $18. So if the stock falls below $18, your shares will then be sold. So it's basically an insurance policy uh, which applies to silver. Let's say the price of silver is $25.10 and you want to make sure that Hey, if it goes below $25, you want to be out of that position. A lot of people place what is called a stop loss order. And that's really at the heart of what we'll be digging into tonight, because you may be aware that here on September 29th, 2020, Department of Justice and the CFTC settled charges against JP Morgan for manipulative and deceptive conduct and spoofing. We'll cover that that spanned at least eight years and involved hundreds of thousands of spoof orders and precious metals. Now, I know that's a little bit vague and doesn't tell you much about what was actually happening. Although fortunately, that is exactly what you are going to see with your own eyes tonight. So to put this in context, I'm gonna play a little bit of this video. Here they're talking about trading on Ethereum, but just if you will, imagine anytime the guy says Ethereum, just replace silver. Again, this would apply to any stock as well. This does happen in the stock market, unfortunately, too. But he does put it in good context. So I'm going to play a little bit of that here. So what happened here, Dick, is anybody that trades these um, cryptos on leverage, which means that they're basically trading on the exchanges or the trading with stops, got destroyed this morning. Because it went down and anybody that had a stop within 50% of where the market closed yesterday was probably knocked out of this market. And visualize it. Even if you got in here and you put a stop down in this range, 13, 14, you're gone. So you'd wake up this morning, your Ethereum is gone, your money is gone, and Ethereum is back up here. So you hear he said that you wake up, your Ethereum is gone, your money's gone, and the price is back up. Just replace that with your silver is gone, your money is gone, and then the price moves back higher. And you're going to see how that's exactly what has been happening in the gold and silver markets. We will stay focused to silver. So here's today's silver chart from March 5th. And you can see a bunch of examples, even just on these past three trading days. Look at the blue line. That's March 3rd. You see that same thing. This is spread out. Trades for a while then pops back up. Mostly anyone who had a stop place at the 2650 level, which is pretty common, 
basically got stopped out of their position, which maybe ultimately worked out well for them this time. Similar here, anyone who had a stop at the 26 level was stopped out of their position. Here you could have anyone who was long a contract but had a stop at the $25 level would have been stopped out here and then lost their position as it goes back up higher. And certainly in the context of what's been happening lately where there's increased buying pressure in the physical market, there are banks that are short, which we'll show confirmation of later. And certainly this is one way of getting out of a short position. Now, on one hand, I don't want to ever accuse someone of something where you don't have the evidence, but again, we'll look at these charts and we have some of the confessions from the banks, which we'll get to shortly enough. So here's an interesting one. This is the beginning of this week coming out of the COMEX delivery cycle as contracts are being delivered. See the price of silver about 2690 ish floating around there, then gets driven lower. Then here you see that same pattern, which will be very familiar by the time you're done with that video. Um, so anyone who had a stop at the 2660 or 2640 levels was knocked out of their position there. Anyone here that had a stop at the $26 level would have been knocked out of their position. So essentially people who were long silver contracts, it's, it's like you're taking them out of their position. They're not you, but whoever was spoofing the hundreds of thousands of times. Don't worry, I understand there's vagary around the word spoofing, but we will come back and cover that. But there you see that same thing that the fella in the crypto video showed. So anyone here would have gotten knocked out of their position. So if you're short and you're willing to commit a felony, this is a very sneaky but clever way of getting people out of their long position and essentially getting off the hook if you were facing a potential short squeeze, which many of these banks have been staring at over the last month of February. And we'll come back to that. Although I could understand if you're watching this, especially if uh, this is the first time you've heard any of my research saying, all right, hey, who are you? And how could, what, what's the proof of this? First of all, I will mention that after graduating Wharton's MBA program, I did trade equity options for Susquehanna International Group on the American and New York Stock Exchange where I was running a specialist options post and so I do feel I have the credentials and background in trading for a living. And also, fortunately, even despite that, don't have to take my word for it, because here we will hear from one of the commissioners, the former commissioners of the CFTC that I was fortunate to have the pleasure to speak to, named Bart Chilton. And let's hear what he says about my my interpretation of what I felt was working. This was before some of this evidence had come out. But again, I want it to be clear that I'm not making any of this stuff up and everything has been verified thoroughly. Um, and here is one example of that. I appreciate you mentioning the spoofing. Curious uh, because uh, my understanding of what, how some of the manipulation has occurred is that you know if silver is trading $20.05, there's a lot of stop orders placed around the $20 handle. So often if the price can get pushed a little bit, then you get a lot of those high frequency algorithms kicking in and then you'll see a drop with many feeling that people kind of nudging a little are then able to buy lower. Does that right. sound like a reasonably accurate portrayal to put it in perspective to folks or would you phrase it differently well it's a, it's a good portray it's a good portrayal but it's actually it's a very good portrayal but the difference in your description is that today when a market moves because of a spoof it can move a lot more and certainly we will see the evidence of that for example here is february 1st of 2021 just uh, about a month ago into february 2nd Again, certainly many of you remember how there was a lot of buying pressure as the word about a lot of these schemes was getting out and people were buying silver. Because when you see some of these things and it's put into proper context, it's kind of like 
it becomes clear as day. Similar to if you don't know German and someone speaking in German, you may have a hard time understanding it, but when someone can translate it to you, and if the person is saying something important in German, all of a sudden you can take the meaning away from it. So that's what I'm doing in this video here and that these charts are doing for me. Again, fortunately, you won't have to take my opinion for any of these things, although you can just look at the chart because here, just like Commissioner Chilton described, you see the spike of volume and then you see it cascade down just like it's falling off a cliff. You see that repeatedly here again, more volume. Now, don't worry if you're saying, hey, that's just one chart. Here's March 3rd, and we'll go through plenty more because in terms of people who don't want to take speculation or conspiracy theory or anything like that, fortunately, what is out there that doesn't really get brought up as much as I personally think it should, but we will do that tonight, is the incredible documents revealed by Deutsche Bank back in 2016 when they got caught and uh, paid a settlement never really admitted what they're paying the settlement for, although they did leave behind some chat transcripts, which tell quite a story that I don't know that I've ever seen anyone really put in context. Well, maybe it's been a couple of years, but a great time to dig back in because especially with what you've just been shown, wait until you see what is coming next. And certainly I can understand if you're sitting there thinking, well, this happened 10, 11, 12 years ago. Is it important to rehash history? Which is a reasonable question, although I'm going to play why I think that's important because certainly, and I might add, this is why I left Wall Street. I understand that there are people who have conflicted views of interest about certain things, but as uh, I've mentioned before, I voluntarily walked away from multiple six-figure income on Wall Street because I felt this was a matter of market integrity. Also affected a lot of people who have been buying gold and silver and been cheated. And a lot of the commentary out there often, to me, just doesn't seem to be accurate or honest. So, for example, when you hear things like... Probably also try to touch on... Um arguments and discussions are, oh, the silver markets uh, clearly manipulated. J.P. Morgan has pled guilty of manipulation. J.P. Morgan has pled, has reached an agreement that it hasn't been supervising its trading desks across assets. And the bulk of the complaints against it were in treasury securities, other debt securities and equities and precious metals. And it was a lack of supervision and a pervasive uh, environment that contributed and allowed uh, traders to spoof the market and diddle around on a daily basis. No grand conspiracy to suppress the price, no bigger conspiracy to suppress the price, just really sloppy management and oversight of a bunch of Wall Street pros. Certainly that's one way of phrasing it. At least he's not denying any of what happened. Certainly that would be silly because here is a Department of Justice plea from Christian Troons who learned to spoof the market for more senior traders and spoof with knowledge and uh, consent of his supervisors. Here is John Edmonds, the first JP Morgan trader caught who admitted that he learned this deceptive trading strategy from more senior traders at the bank. And he personally deployed this strategy hundreds of times with the knowledge and consent of his immediate supervisors. Of course, there is Michael Nowak, who also has a case currently ongoing, which is significant because he is a board member of the London Bullion Metals Association which obviously is not ideal. Yet since there are often videos like that, passing this off as if this is something normal and people should be okay with it. Now that I've showed you the impact of how someone can actually have their contract taken from them, and especially you've, you'll see the impact of the price, which shows the possibility for things to be front run and is just beyond anything I ever saw or even imagined again, I was running, wasn't just trading in the crowd in the New York Stock Exchange, was running the specialist post. That mean, I had legal responsibility to maintain fair and orderly trading. So I think I have some credentials to say this. But here you see 2007, October 9th, we pushed through yesterday's low triggering sales stops. 
seems pretty manipulative. Here you have February 25th, 2008, Fortis. Trader B says, can't wait for another day when we get the bulldozer out the garage on gold or silver. They're my first port of call, laughs about it. Let me know when they start quoting. Deutsche Bank trader uh, is finding that funny. And then again, that's February 25th, 2008. What does a bulldozer look like? It's quite powerful as you can, I don't know if I've ever seen this before. The Kitco chart couldn't even handle the volatility. Green is February 25th. And certainly that looks like the exact definition of what you saw of someone getting spoofed out, very manipulative. And then you see these patterns throughout the day. But let's keep going on because here's February 3rd, 2009, Millennium Partners, honest opinion is HSBC brutal in metals. Deutsche Bank says they front run whenever they can in spot and take no prisoners. So I would suggest when you hear people saying that the metals manipulation is conspiracy. Yes, I would agree that is the definition of a conspiracy. These aren't people working as part of the same unit. Those are supposed to be independent banks. So that's February 3rd, 2009. December 2nd, 20, 2009. Deutsche Bank Trader C, we going to do this? Guess we are going to do Uzi. Tomorrow morning at the earliest. I would really prefer if you waited until I could front run it. Okay. So that's December 2nd, 2009. Here's October 15th, 2010. UBS trader, going to bend this silver lower. Deutsche Bank, oh dear, my boss just said he bought some. The UBS says I have to be sneaky then, uh, to which he then follows up. Had to really work for that one. Told you I'd bend it lower for you. I would say it's not too sneaky to put that on a chat transcript that can be reviewed and then matched up to the price chart. So as you can see again here, that's October 15th, 2010, which would be the green line here. So you see about 24.75. We don't have a timestamp on that, but look here from 24.50. If anyone had a stop at 24.50, boy, did they get removed from their position. Keep in mind, this is October 15th of 2010, when things were deteriorating so much that only a month later, Ben Bernanke would write an op-ed describing why he was launching QE2, which really in any rational non-manipulated world would have sent the silver price much higher than its $19.80, $50 high, especially with all of the money printing that has been added into the world since then. But now you have an idea why on October 15th, 2010, the silver price declined despite the fundamentals because UBS trader A was talking about how sneaky he had to be to bend this silver lower. And we already went through the mechanics of how specifically that is accomplished. But let us continue on because here, January 12th, 2011, they're even talking about the stops that they're gonna bust through. Here's Deutsche Bank Trader B. We still good with the silver stop. UBS Trader A, just make sure to bust through it for a print. Ha ha, yes, we need to bust it. January 12th, 2011 in the green line here. So I don't have a timestamp, but if those stops were at 2960 where those customers got ripped off or again here or here, um, it's one thing I find interesting. I mentioned I was an options trader, which is trading the volatility by nature. And I never understood when people say, hey, you can make money as long as the markets are volatile. Well, now it makes complete sense because if you can rig it back and forth, jerk it back and forth like that, then yeah, it's actually pretty easy to make money if you can, as these traders said, uh, bust through the stops and commit a conspiracy collusion intra-bank, then yes, in that scenario, it is easy to make money because just because something is volatile, well, you could be volatile and you get the wrong direction, but when you can bust through stops like that, yes, then it is a lot easier to make money. Now here on February 8th, you can hear the excitement. It's palpable like the Super Bowl. Here we go. Here we go. Dude, near the high, I'm going to ramp it. Guns blazing exactly as in it's three, two, one, boom. So especially when you see that you have Deutsche Bank and UBS, I would agree that this is a conspiracy because if you look up the definition of a conspiracy, 
a secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or harmful. And we heard Bart Chilton talk about how blatantly illegal this is. I never did anything like this when I was running my specialist post. I knew that if I did something like this, I expected to be in jail the next day. So the only difference I have is that when people call it conspiracy theory, I don't know what's the theory about that. Perhaps they could match that when you say three, two, one, boom. And then the chart looks like this. Were they booming it here to get people out of a position or here to get people out of a position or here went, went from 2940 to 3040? Um, I don't know. And we'll see if Jeff Christian explains that in one of his upcoming videos. I've not heard him comment on that when he gives out information that I feel is pretty darn harmful. March 31st, 2011, UBS Trader A, I got to stop in silver now at 39.50. And then he mentions in an hour, he's going to call for reinforcement. I don't know what that means, but here we have a follow-up. I got three, we'll need all the reinforcement we could get. Now, what on earth could have happened on March 31st, 2011 that needed so much reinforcement? Well, again, that's something that hopefully lawyers will be able to bring some of these fellows into a courtroom. Certainly, I don't know, did someone get stopped out there? A lot of unusual volatility, not even as close to what happened on March 30th, or March 29th, where you see around $37, same fraudulent pattern that has popped up. And uh, I guess that's what they were calling reinforcements for. Here's April 1st, 2011. UBS Trader A saying, trying to coordinate moves together here. That would be a conspiracy. I don't know who he was talking to, but he says, we got to do it the same time next time. If we are correct and we do it together, we screw other people harder. Again, it's unclear who he is speaking to here. Uh, although I would say anyone that's taken money from UBS and traded silver, I don't know if UBS is one of the clients that Jeff Christian always mentions, but here, that's certainly not something I'd want to be associated with. If we are correct and do it together, we screw other people harder. And let's see, what does it look like when they screw other people harder? I wonder if he's talking about here where silver, if anyone had a 3760 stop in at that level or 3740 and basically was long. And here they get removed from their long position as silver goes back up that would be screwing people pretty hard. Um, and that does sound like a conspiracy. And here you can see they actually gave a little more color here saying started pushing too early. So even as blatant and disgusting as this behavior is, they still managed to not execute it in a way that would have been efficient yet. Silver is again, still April 1st, 2011. Silver, you got anything top? Please tell me stops. So again, this is what you're, they're talking about when they got hundreds of thousands of times of spoofing and you're seeing on these charts, hey, fireworks, Deutsche Bank getting in on the conspiracy on April 1st. April 4th, here's another conspiracy between HSBC and Deutsche Bank because HSBC felt like shorting it. Mate, been trying to short this in the 30s five times. HSBC says, yeah, I guess so. Just offered some at 40. Here's some interesting records from April 6, 2011. There, Deutsche Bank giving instructions on who's supposed to smash the price that day. Barclays confirming that he is short, laughing and saying that we are one team, one dream. Uh, I'll bet anyone who actually had an honest dream probably finds that offensive. Here is April 13th, 2011, UBS Trader A says, shall we trade 1 million ounces of silver together again? Deutsche Bank Trader B laughs at it, says he doesn't mind, which confirms the conspiracy theory, takes it into an official conspiracy. We define the definition there here in case there was any mystery left. We're selling buddies. That's true, can't be long, got a hammer, and then he laughs in the face of anybody who believes in actually going to work every day and doing a job with honor and integrity so that he can steal directly from your savings and your pension and your investment. If you were smart enough to realize that gold and silver were what should have been rising following all of the money printing that has been going on in these past couple of years. Here's April 20th, 2011, Deutsche Bank Trader B. 
want to push silver with me and it's funny again. They don't think it's politically correct and most certainly it is not. Here's April 20th, you see quite a rally. And then if you stop, let's say you were a banker and you could see that US was doing QE2, silver was still lower than its 1980 high before there was even a trillion dollars of debt. And you could see where this was headed. And I don't know, but I would say that with commentary like that, there's a good chance that could be a spoof, which would have forced people out of a long position as the price goes higher. So yes, they did screw their customers again there. <clears throat> April 20th, a little more confirmation, want to push silver with me? And he laughs saying, I don't think this is politically correct on chat. I would certainly agree with that. Here's an interesting one, May 11th, 2011. So this is after silver got pummeled from $49 in 2011. That was April 30th into May 1st. So just 10 days after that, you see UBS Trader A, I got faith, I got two more hours. This is like trading church. So for anybody who actually has any sort of real faith for any spiritual beliefs, this is what the banks have faith in, stealing from you. And I think that a lot of the people that I've met who get into silver are good, honest people, usually pretty darn intelligent that actually go out and do good things in the world, donate to church, donate to good causes, and UBS was laughing in your face while taking that money from you so that they could buy at market and fuck everyone so bad. That's what these banks are doing. So next time you hear that it's a conspiracy theory, I would suggest just correct someone and say that it is a conspiracy, but it's not a theory because here on May 11th, this is this green line, that's what it looks like for... Deutsche Bank and UBS to fuck everyone so bad. Green line right there. We're in the face of unprecedented money printing that normally would have already sent the currency or the gold and silver soaring because that's traditionally when people realize what governments and banks are doing. That's the canary in the coal mine. And to prevent this, this was 2011, to delay being caught, to delay, to cover up the crime which has now gone on for another decade. Here's the evidence of how they fucked the world so badly. Okay, take a look at this one. That green line, that's $39. Silver moved down $4 that day. Well, Deutsche Bank and UBS had a big party laughing and bragging about how they fucked everyone so bad. So anybody that believes in being honest, going to their job every day, saving, got fucked really badly there. And it's absolutely disgusting, but at least now the evidence is there because certainly anyone who actually goes to church and has any uh, decency or respect for someone's uh, spiritual faith, um, if you do have a lawyer and you wanna get involved, you think it's disgusting that these guys are doing that and bragging about it. Anyway, we'll see, there's the chart one more time. But actually, continues on because uh, here they're bragging about how we are the silver market. You guys short some funky options. We smashed it so good and they were jealous about not being in a bigger share of the conspiracy, not conspiracy theory, but conspiracy, which if you watch any videos of people going on Kitco saying that, it's a conspiracy theory, then maybe you can leave comments and tell them that you don't want to hear from them anymore. That's what I'm going to do. Again, here at UBS Trader A, we smashed it so good. Of course, just a day after that, silver is broken, bragging about it. So here you see Merrill Trader A, I sweep them, fuck these guys. Why would anyone care? I'll bet the people that lost Depending on how many ounces of silver someone owned or what fund they were invested in, $4 move on silver, 39 down to 35. I'll bet there's people who lost a lot of money on that one. And now you know why. Deutsche Bank paid out $38 million. <laughs> June 8th, 2011. Oh, this is a special one because you know how it's conspiracy theory to say that there's a cartel, but here is UBS, the criminal themselves. I'm gonna sell a little more. We need to grow our mafia. 
Let's get a third position involved. Okay, Deutsche Bank says, okay, calling Barclays. <laughs> I don't, it's amazing. I guess Merrill Lynch must have been busy that day. So here, actually, UBS referring to this disgusting behavior as a mafia. So the next time you hear someone say, oh, this is silly, they talk about the cartel, use the correct terminology, say, no, um, excuse me, UBS referred to it as a mafia. That's June 8th, 2011. Here you can see June 8th. Wow, there's silver at 3880. Has quite a wild day, similar to what we saw earlier this week. That's June 8th, thanks to the mafia. Here's also June 8th, the same day. If you have stops, who are you going to call? The Stop Busters. Deutsche Bank is singing along, actually singing along via chat. The Ghostbusters theme song. Reminds me of one of those scenes in prison where the mafia guy gets caught and then starts crying in his prison jail. Bet he wouldn't be singing it there. Also on June 8th, everything stays here. Uh, so no need to repeat this in the future. It saves us typing because we are just so paranoid. Yeah, it might have been good not to type that. Um, if might have been good not to do it, first of all. But yes, it was not wise to type that. Here, July 7th, 2011, where are your stops in silver? So again, that's more conspiracy. And here we go, July 26, 2011. Intraday's why we killed a lot of people. I've heard in the time I've been doing the show that there were certain people that because they lost money or lost jobs, obviously a lot of people around the globe, whether it's the investors, let alone the people that work for the mining company, not easy to get silver out of the ground. I've heard that people have committed suicide over this matter which makes it seem a little insensitive that UBS trader A was bragging about killing a lot of people, just jobbing them between me and you, there's 100K taken out of this market as July 26, 2011. And here you can see the volatility, a very unnatural chart. I don't know if the people with stops at the 4040 level were the ones that got killed as that moved higher but somebody paid the loss that funded that guy's bonus that year. Now, here we go on August 5th, 2011. This is an interesting one for me because I actually remember exactly what I was doing back at that time. I was writing a long article because the US was blowing through the debt ceiling. This was right before they got downgraded by Standard and Poor. Here you see S&P downgraded the credit rating of the United States government for the first time in history. Certainly the kind of event that would lead people to buy gold and silver. Then you see August 2nd, 2011 deadline. Get the exact day they reached a resolution, whether it blew through that or not, but it was quite a spectacle, led them to get downgraded. And here you see, stay short, it's gonna be one of those days. I bought another 100,000 XAG for the Chinese. I don't know if that means they were screwing the Chinese on this one. But it's interesting because in the middle of all of that, the green is August 5th. So I don't know if this was the Chinese they were screwing out of their position at that spoof there. But look at what happens on August 4th here. Anyone who had a stop at the 42 level and was watching the U.S. get downgraded by S&P and thought, gee, I'm concerned about the dollar especially if they've worked their entire life and have savings in a retirement account. Actually, we're conned into putting it into the trading desk of one of these bullion banks. Fortunately, there's not records from the conversation August 4th, but I'll bet that anyone who got stopped at, that's $42. And this dropped the $39 in two hours to $40 in about five minutes, it looks like. And then on the 5th, you do see that stay short. It's going to be one of those days. I wonder if he meant similar to the day previous to that. But anyway, here's August 11th. If you want to accelerate it, go short 20K silver. Stay on the offer in one second. Doesn't require much ammo. Avalanche can be triggered by a pebble if you get the timing right. Confirming what Commissioner Chilton said. Here's August 11th. I don't know if this is when they triggered the avalanche, which bounced right back up. A lot of things in that particular time period, which look pretty fraudulent in my opinion. Here is August 11th. As you can see, learning always. Please write me a check when you're a billionaire. So this is the confirmation of the criminal mafia-like behavior that 
Jeff Christian did acknowledge was common practice, fortunately. Here, it depends what kind of market. Sometimes you use muscle, sometimes you use blade. This is blade, but then two guys doing it like this together is still small muscle and blade. Yeah, dude, I like it like double dragon. All right, it's kind of amazing that no one's gone to gel on this one. Here, August 12, 2011, using the blade on silver again. I wonder if this was when they used the blade or was that the blade? Um, maybe the CFTC rather than investigating the Reddit traders could explain to us what using the blade means. Commissioner Benham, you put out a press release saying that you're looking at silver manipulation and you're gonna go harass and threaten people who are exercising their freedom of speech. Why don't you answer what's the blade? If that's what came out the last day after day in February, be ashamed of yourself. Why don't you check this trading record? We got a trigger finger here. That cracked me up. Here they're laughing in your face, Benham. Good times, just wanna go boom. He doesn't want the pistol training, wanna go straight for the bazooka. The CFTC has the audacity to go harass the people that are paying their damn salary that the CFTC is supposed to protect. August 15, 2011, there. I either use the blade or the boom, I don't even remember. Gonna blade silver now, August 16th. That's what it looks like to blade silver now. I think we should muscle silver, go for the illiquid currency on the 17th, daily basis. I don't know, is that muscle on the way up and then blade it on the way down? CFTC doesn't have any comment on that. Teach you a fun trick with silver, boom, stops go through. We've already explained how that works. That's August 17th, you looked at the chart. I know these idiots were hiding behind 50 when I trigger it, gonna send it sky motherfucking high. Now you know why your silver market trades like it does. CFTC, to my knowledge, has never commented. Why do I have to go to Nick Laird's site? I have to pay to go to some guy because he takes his time to compile all this and the CFTC is silent. It's disgusting. Here, go make your millions now, Jedi Master. I knew there were idiots when I, that I could steal from when I trigger. It's gonna send it motherfucking high. Please keep all your tricks to yourself. While you're stealing from them, maybe you shouldn't put it on chat. Here's Deutsche Bank UBS. We couldn't even push it higher yesterday, but last week we had some fun learning how to blade it and stuff. I thought, I think we caught two moves on 10 bucks. See down there, this is 2011, August 18th. Where do you see the chart on this one? Here's August. Look at that. Is that blading and muscling? What'd they call it? Learning how to blade it and stuff. I think we caught two moves on 10 bucks. This guy's paid a $38 million fine. How much did they, how much did they make when they pushed it from muscled it and bladed it? from 38 to 44 and then down like that. Now anyone who's lost a lot of money in gold and silver despite just using common sense, now you know why. Blade at $10. Here's August 22nd, at least again, one of the few things I agree with, Deutsche Bank Trader B calling it dirty. Yes, this is dirty, this is disgusting, this is vile, it's August 22nd. Here's August 22nd on the chart. That looks pretty dirty to me, especially given what Commissioner Chilton, the only one in that CFTC that's ever had any honor, decency. I wonder if that was muscling and blading there. Who knows? But that's what I would do is that's what I would pull the records on if I were running the CFTC. But I have to do their job blindly with my hands tied behind my back without access to the records. But I go through this and capture screenshots and tell the people who've been cheated while the CFTC investigates the people who've been cheated. Here's September 26, 2011. I don't know how to play today. Keep 2000 short. Well, that's a conspiracy. They're agreeing on it. September 26, 2011. Well, there you go. Price of silver goes from $36 to $30. After the US got downgraded. Six over 36, that's one six. What is that? Uh, 12, 15%, something like that in one day. Here's acting chairman Rostam Benham. Here's the notice he made February 1st. CFTC is closely monitoring recent activity in the silver market. The commission is communicating with fellow regulators, the exchanges and the stakeholders. No, that's not true. Not communicating with the stakeholders. 
and I'll, and I'll show how untrue this is in a second. Any potential threats, the integrity of the deri derivatives market for silver. Yeah, there is threats to the integrity remains vigilant in surveying these markets. Give me a break. Here's the CFTC's mission statement to promote integrity, resilience, and vibrancy of the U.S. derivative markets. Here's, the, here's what I submitted through their TPS report system, the one whistleblower program, February 12th. So in the middle of everything that's going on and getting information out to the public, spent the whole day with a lawyer, writing down all the evidence, plenty of detail. This is what was sent to them on the 12th. Here's the chart showing them the volume. Here it is laid out. Here it is all explained. Dropped the price of silver during the early morning of 2 a.m. Here's the interview with Bart Chilton, former commissioner that you saw who, who laid it out. Here is a few hours later on Tuesday at 4.59 a.m. Eastern, Market Watch published a story by J.P. Morgan downgrading the sector in the face of record additions to their own trust and, and physical buying that dealers around the globe reported was in excess of anything they had seen in their entire career. That includes people who were around for the days of the Hunt brothers that put their name and face to that on my channel. So with all due respect, this comes across as very disingenuous when tied with things like this. Here, Deutsche Bank saying, stop out, sucker people back in. Here's GATA, who also put themselves at financial jeopardy to do the CFTC's job for free. Publishing Andrew McGuire, laying this out for Elliot Ramirez in 2010, telling him how it would play out before, here, since a couple slides, past example. This is exact same thing that happened when Harry Markopoulos was telling this SEC for years the evidence of Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme, which they ignored and allowed people to lose billions and billions more. Guess who was their banker? JP Morgan. So with all due respect, when you hear about conspiracy theories, turn this guy off for starters. There, you can read the article for yourself. February 2nd, 2021, while the market came down 10%. The day where they added 61 million shares into their own damn SLV trust. When you see this chart here, again, this is end of the COMEX delivery cycle. We see that the CFTC is harassing the people who've been victimized. So when you wonder what was happening there, and then you see Jeff Curry of Goldman Sachs, one of the authorized participants, the SLV trust that allegedly added that metal, it's about 10% of the trust. They added 10% of the trust in the day that the silver price came down 10%. Here's Jeff Curry, authorized participant, explaining why a short squeeze is unattainable. You look at the flows going in and out of these ETFs, they're not that big. But, but I guess my question is, forget the ETF, um, in terms of thinking about how are you going to create a squeeze, the shorts are the ETFs. The ETFs buy the physical, they turn around and they sell on the COMEX. The shorts are the ETFs, they buy the physical, they turn around and sell on the COMEX, calls it a hedge. But if JP Morgan and SLV is just a custodian, that's for people who want to buy physical silver. They send their money to BlackRock. BlackRock passes it to JP Morgan. If there's any hedge there, it'd be to buy long because they have to match a long exposure. So there's no short exposure there. JP Morgan buys the metal, puts it in the pile. What is there to hedge? Here you can see what other people call conspiracy theory. I call evidence. This is the iShares prospectus from page 10. The trust does not hold or trade in commodity futures. The trust does not hold or trade in commodity futures. The trust does not hold or trade in commodity futures. So what is Jeff Curry and Goldman Sachs as an authorized participant? You should know better. What are they hedging? Actually, looks like Bix Weir found out exactly what they're hedging. This guy right here, Goldman Sachs, is an authorized participant in the ETF. Now look at this, page eight. This is SLV's perspective. The trust is a passive investment vehicle. It also means that the trustee does not make use of any of the hedging techniques available to silver, to professional silver investors to attempt to reduce risk of losses resulting from prices price decreases. Oh my God, that's exactly the opposite of what Jeff Curry said. This also means that the trustee does not 
make use of any of the hedging techniques available to professional silver investors to attempt to reduce the risk of losses resulting from price decreases. Jeff Curry said, the, tr- the ETF is the, is the short. They are the one hedging the metal. So Jeff Curry lied. He provided false and misleading information to the investing public, and they are an authorized participant. They are an active player, active participant, one of the lead people at SLV. Where is the SEC? If they can throw Martha Stewart in jail for selling some shares of her stock, why don't they throw Goldman Sachs in jail? Why isn't Jeff Curry in jail for providing false and misleading evidence? And how can we prove it? Right here. Goldman Sachs. House account delivered 29,000, 29 or 2,900 contracts, 14.5 million ounces, right? I'll take a look at this. This is the SLV silver inventories since the day, the last day of the February contract traded, 66,950. Bang, 11 million ounces have been pulled out of SLV. Not only did Jeff Curry state that he wasn't doing it, that that they were doing it, he actually did it. He pulled silver out of the SLV to cover a naked short on the comics. And yet the CFTC is investigating the Reddit traders. That's something that if you want to file a suit against the CFTC that I would suggest you, you have your lawyer explain that one. Here we see... U.S. ends long-running silver probe. This is dated September 25th, 2013. U.S. regulators closed a five-year investigation into the alleged manipulation of silver, wasting 7,000 staff hours that they charged people for. This is the CFTC that later found hundreds of thousands of occasions of spoofing, and we just showed what spoofing does to the price during this exact period where the CFT says they found nothing. So... I think that means that anything they say is useless. Fortunately, there was one commissioner that did actually speak up and honor and fulfill his oath. To that, I'm completely grateful for Bart. Let's hear a little bit about what he said. Along the lines of that meeting, I was actually watching one of the videos again the other day, and I know between Jeff Christian and Adrian Douglas, they were disputing whether the metal is actually there to back the paper claims, whether via contracts on the COMEX or derivatives. Curious your thoughts. It seems to me like we're in a situation where we've had, we now have a fractional banking system in the metals. From what you've seen, is there actually metal in existence that these claims could be fulfilled or is there an imbalance in there somewhere? There is never in silver and soybeans and oil There's never enough physical to back up all of the contracts, the futures contracts. Never is. Um, I think a good gauge was like 10 to 1. Uh, I'm not sure they ain't in silver, but an overarching among all commodities, 10 to 1. Um, You know, futures are essentially, and traders hate when I say this, but they're essentially bets. They're gambles. And they don't play out. No, everybody's not collecting them all at the same time. When there's an expiration, people get out of the contracts because nobody wants to hold on to a bunch of crude oil. They don't have enough swimming pools um, around in their yards. So um, there's never enough. Um, and that fact that uh, there's never enough seemed to me to be some you know, basis for – a lot of the conspiracy theorists in the silver community. And, well, it's not there, so it must be you know, messed up. There must be something sneaky going on. Well, it happens with every single commodity. It's, not, it's, it's, it's how the systems work. Now, you can d- debate whether or not it's good or bad or not, but you know, you, you, if, you, if, you have a, if you want a futures contract, you're going to have more out there uh, in contracts uh, then there is physical supply for um, right. just the way it is. They're futures contracts. 
Now, with all due respect to Bart there, I would disagree about the impact of that system. And certainly, I think you've seen that play out over the last month where you've had this pressure building because, yeah, you can say that it's unlikely that people are ever going to take delivery of their contracts at the same time, but that doesn't factor in what's happening with the dollar and that 40% of the dollars that are in existence have been printed in the last year. Janet Yellen's ready to go big. So the government, from a monetary standpoint, is basically guaranteeing that you're going to get to that exact point. Of course, Jeff Christian, as mentioned in my question to Bart there, actually did speak about this at the CFTC's 2010 meeting, and wait till you hear what he said there. One of the things that the people who criticize the bullion banks and talk about this undue uh, large positions don't understand is the nature of the long positions of the physical market. And we don't help it. The CFTC, when it did its most recent report on, on silver, uh, used the term which we use in the market, the physical market. And we use that term, as did the CFTC in that report, to talk about the OTC market, forwards, OTC options, physical metal, and everything else. And people will say, well, there is, and you've heard it today, there's not that much physical metal out there. There isn't. But in the physical market, as the market uses that term, there is much more metal than that. There's a hundred times what there is. If I look at the large, if I look at the large short positions on the COMEX silver contract, my question is, where are the other shorts being hedged? Well, that is certainly my question too. Where are these hedges? I've spoken with executives from most of the primary silver mining companies. They don't hedge. And we hear this hedge term thrown around a lot. And it's a bit of a mystery to me where these hedges are. I'll play the rest of Jeff's answer so at least you can hear what he says. Because the short position that I believe bullion banks use to hedge their physicals is larger than their short position on the COMEX. And the answer is they hedge it in the OTC market in London. I thank you for that uh, detailed uh, discussion, and I don't. And at the very end there, that was Gary Gensler, former Goldman Sachs, who's now the head of the SEC. And given that this meeting took place in 2010, that meant he was head of the CFTC during the time they said they found nothing, where now we're finding hundreds of thousands of blatant pieces of evidence of manipulation. Although you mentioned that there were other many other things you saw that did raise the alarm, uh, anything that you can get into again while respecting the confidentiality with the agency, but some of the things sure. that you did see that raised your attention. Well, there's some stuff that's out there in the public that I'm not sure everybody, you know, put together. Um, most people did. I would never, for example, and I won't now, um, say that. Um, you know, there was uh, a bank and name it that held, uh, you know, close to 40 percent of the silver market at one point. Um, but the news reports, I mean, people surmise it's J.P. Morgan Chase and the news reports uh, in the public record showed that when Bear Stearns collapsed, that their silver positions got transferred over to J.P. Morgan. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, the CFTC, had to approve those positions because they, those positions, the layman positions, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Bear Stearns positions, uh, the Bear Stearns positions, when they came over, combined with JP's positions, were so large that they violated the position limits on which one trader could hold. So the CFTC had to approve that JP could take on the bare silver positions. So people want to do the math, they can do the math on who had the largest silver. Um, but there was an exception there that we made and that's in the public record. Uh, what's not really uh, looked at too much is that we made that uh, uh, allowance for a time certain, and I forget exactly how long it was, but it was not years, it was, you know, months, maybe it was three months or six months, or maybe it was nine months. I think it was probably six, but I, I don't recall. Um, 
And that allowance was for them to uh, be able to get out of those positions. Right. Well, one thing we didn't know right at first is that there was a uh, the head silver trader for Bear. Uh, he went with the silver positions to JP, and so he's trading at JP. And after this time was coming to an end, the, 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 the runway which we had given for them to get out of the positions in excess of position limits, they were nowhere close to getting out of them. Matter of fact, at one point, they'd bought even more. Right. Which was like direct, you know, conflict to what we had in mind, um, and so they were granted a little bit more time, a couple of months, as I recall, and they did ultimately get down to the, the position. But it was at that time that I, when they were so large, that I made the, the comment about how large a particular bank was uh, in the, the market, which sort of shocked people, and it shocked me, quite frankly, that it was so large. Uh, anyway, these were uh, uh, sort of troubling times, and um, a lot of this uh, was going on and the, the uh, accused uh, manipulation, and uh, it was a, a really uh, time-certain period at which uh, our investigators were, were looking at market participants, including uh, those at uh, that institution. Um, they had such large positions to ensure that uh, everything was okay. And the bottom line is uh, we found a lot of things that indicated things were not okay. Uh, and uh, I talked about that a little bit. So you heard what he said there about the big positions. Listen here to what he says about how that can impact the market. Yeah, and for folks who might be a little bit newer to it, can you explain why the you know, a big concentrated position is something that the CFT looks for and is, is on the watch for to be careful about and how that impacts the market or has the potential to impact the market. Well, I mean, if you and I are trading in the futures markets, uh, you know, for our personal account, nobody's going to notice. Uh, but if you've got a, a, a sizable position and you trade that sizable position, it, it, it's the one thing if you just have it. But if you're trading it, that, you know, all of a sudden 20% of the market goes long or goes short, um, that can move markets. Right. And uh, so that's why there are uh, not what I want with regard to position limits. So that's a whole other topic of, of uh, further position limits. But there are some position limits in what is called the spot month. That's the delivery month. Um, that month where you hope everybody doesn't get a, you know, right. a <laughs> pool full of oil. Um, and uh, so there are limits in the spot months. There's not limits in what we call the um, the back months. That's every month other than the spot months or all months combined, which would be the spot month and the back months. Right, those limits uh, I pushed for, but uh, have not been put in place, even though they're required by law. Keep in mind, this was from the investigation that ended on September 25th, 2013, when the CFTC said they're not going to recommend charges. And we'll share what Bart said about that particular point in a little bit. They said the CFTC only rarely comments publicly on whether it has opened or closed any particular investigation. And at this time, there is no viable basis to bring enforcement action. Yet, it's interesting because it certainly seems like what Bart shared there was significant. And I spoke with him. That was 2019 when I recorded that. So how come the CFTC never mentioned anything about that? Which, especially when you look, here's September 25th, 2013, almost seven years to the day in 2020. Then they say... They're settling for manipulative and deceptive conduct and spoofing that spanned eight years and involved hundreds of thousands of spoof orders. So my question to any legal experts or people bringing a case, is that obstruction of justice to have not shared any of what Bart said there? It seems pretty relevant 
because while people like Jeff Christian were going on talking about how it was conspiracy theory, Jeff Curry goes on CNBC talking about how a short squeeze can't be caused because of position limits. Here we find out Bart Chilton talking about how the position limits were violated. Of course, we can see just by looking at the delivery reports, we can see they've been violated and they continue to be violated. But I'm curious if this is obstruction of justice and the fact that the CFTC did not disclose that until I tracked down Bart Chilton, they still haven't commented on it since then. And they're opening an investigation of the Reddit traders so they can harass the victims of the crime. So I wonder, is this obstruction of justice? And does this make the CFTC an accomplice to the crime? The traders that have uh, large positions that are approaching those limits or above those limits or, or limits or had an exemption from those limits. They are particularly uh, traders that could royal markets by with large trades. Um, so it doesn't mean that they're a problem just because they have the positions, but they're certainly suspect. And uh, regulators look at those sorts of things because they can push or pull markets around inappropriately, and that can uh, damage a lot of uh, a, a lot of average folks and a lot of other traders. Now, if you're wondering why that's significant and why, rather than harassing the Reddit traders, the CFTC should look into what their own former commissioner said, consider what Jeff Curry said on February fourth on CNBC when he was asked if it was possible for silver to be short squeezed. In terms of thinking about how are you going to create a squeeze, the shorts are the ETFs. The ETFs buy the physical, they turn around and they sell on the COMEX to be able to hedge that physical position like any other corporate. It's right. not a naked short like an inequity. But here's the main reason why I don't think it's possible to squeeze one of these markets uh, like what the Hunt brothers did in 1980. You got position limits in these markets. And they've gotten tighter and tighter. There's seven and a half million ounces right now. So while Jeff Curry is saying the reason you can't have a short squeeze is because of position limits, here's the CME on January 28th releasing an amendment to the position limits. I see that they changed the position limits. I go down here, I see gold futures 6,000, spot month net delivery. Silver futures, 3,000. And here is gold. Here's Goldman Sachs. Let me see gold futures, 8,900. And if the irony of that weren't big enough, here you see JP Morgan. This is the silver report. And that's 3,356 contracts that they issued, which is over the limit of 3,000. So with all due respect to Jeff, and to Jeff, who has the audacity to say that a short squeeze is impossible because of the position limits, and then you see his bank and JP Morgan blow through the position limits, that's something that anybody who wants to sue these banks for what they've done, certainly I would include in the note to your lawyer. I would never, for example, and I won't now, um, say that, um, you know, there was uh, a bank and name it that held, uh, you know, close to 40% of the silver market at one point. Um, but the news reports, I mean, people surmise it's JP Morgan Chase, and the news reports uh, in the public record showed that when Bear Stearns collapsed, that their silver positions got transferred over to JP Morgan. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, the CFTC, had to approve those positions. Because the Bear Stearns positions, when they came over, combined with JP's positions, were so large that they violated the position limits on which one trader could hold. So the CFTC had to approve that JP could take on the Bear Silver positions. So people want to do the math, they can do the math on who had the largest silver. Um, but there was an exception there that we made, and that's in the public record. Uh, what's not really uh, looked at too much is that we made that uh, uh, allowance 
for a time certain, and I forget exactly how long it was, but it was not years. It was, you know, months. Maybe it was three months or six months or maybe it was nine months. I think it was probably six, but I, I don't recall. Um, and that allowance was for them to uh, be able to get out of those positions. And after this time was coming to an end, the, 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 the runway which we had given for them to get out of the positions in excess of position limits, they were nowhere close to getting out of them. Matter of fact, at one point, they'd bought even more. So there's former Commissioner Bart Chilton talking about how J.P. Morgan did take over the position from Bear Stearns when Bear Stearns failed, and how the size of their position was over the CFTC's position limit. He did them a favor by giving them a waiver rather than stopping them out like they stop everybody else out on hundreds of thousands of occasions. This was the investigation that the CFTC said found nothing. Bart Chilton tells you exactly what they found, and I'll play that in a second. And then you can ask Ross Benham why he hasn't commented on that while he's harassing the Reddit traders. But here's Bart Chilton acknowledging that they were given a temporary waiver. He doesn't remember whether it was three, six, or nine months, but they had actually made the position bigger. The deal took place March 14th through 16th right, surrounding the Ides of March, coming up in a couple of weeks. There, within a couple of days, March 17, there's silver, $21, falling like a rock. Now, keep in mind, you might say, all right, well, why should silver have been going up? This is in the midst of the housing bubble. In 2004, you have interest rates. 2003, Fed lowers interest rates to 1%. Start hiking in June of 2004 gets all the way up to five and a quarter by June of 2006. Here you can see as a result of that, 2007, here's September where the Fed starts cutting interest rates. Then they just cut interest rates a little. We went from five and a quarter down to 3% before the Bear Stearns JP Morgan deal. That's 225 basis points. Put that in context, when the Fed said everything was good and that QE worked from 2008 until a decade later, 2018, it went from zero to 225. So they raised, it took them 10 years to raise 225 basis points and they had to reverse it when they did. They started cutting rates shortly after that because the market started wobbling. So it's not an accident that when you have a 225 basis interest rate cut, which was historic then between September of 2007 and March of 2008, here's silver was at $12 rallies. In the face of that, investment banks are failing. And then right here, when the deal goes down, within days, silver starts falling. If you remember 2008, the summer was very chaotic. Right around here, that's where Lehman Brothers collapses in September of 2008. Yet, in the face of all this, and look at what the Fed was doing. The day of March 18th of 2008, Fed cut 75 basis points. 75 basis points three days after the deal. It's a historic cut. And look at silver get destroyed. I have bullion dealers on record because unlike other people out there that accuse other people of being conspiracy theorists and run their mouth and say things that aren't true. Before you ever heard of me, the reason why is that I was studying this, researching this. Here's the big silver short, which consists of interviews of 15 of the world's top silver experts. This was the investigation I felt the CFTC should have done, but chose to investigate Reddit traders instead. We have bullion dealers reporting that there was no product online. US Mint went offline. When they finally came back online, silver is $9. They say, here's your Silver Eagle, $17.50. This is why J.P. Morgan was making its position bigger over the three, six, or nine months. That's where the deal happened. It's the three, six, or nine months they're making their position bigger. And you saw from the records what spoofing means. Now, in case you're thinking that something doesn't seem to feel right or add up about what you're hearing from the CFTC now, consider what former CFTC Commissioner Bart Chilton says right here. Contacted me uh, through emails and I responded to 
uh, every every one of them, uh, every one of them that wasn't calling me a rat or <laughs> other names, I responded to them. Uh, and all times of the day, I responded to them. And all through the weekend, I responded to them. And I ended up being the only commissioner, there were five commissioners at the CFTC, who felt like it was a responsibility to do so. Matter of fact, the other commissioners all got those uh, emails blocked um, from their computers, which I found uh, pretty disappointing. So those aren't my words. That's former CFTC Commissioner Bart Chilton describing his disappointment over how the other commissioners who said they found nothing, they were blocking the evidence. Now you paid the bill for it if you're watching this today and you invested in silver. While the CFTC was blocking the evidence and now they're coming after you again. So you hear a lot about this short position. You see this guy do two hour presentations about silver fact and fantasy. But fortunately, we are going to put some fact and eliminate his fantasy. CFTC actually publishes this. This one's interesting. This is their COT report. See, we're looking at silver here. This is March 2nd. So you have the open interest, 158,000, 5,000 ounces per contract. That comes out to 790 million ounces. Here you have this unusual thing here. By net position, four or less traders. So four traders are short 35.6% of the market. This guy tells you about how that's a hedge. So people lease it to refiners. And metallurgist, why are they leasing metal? When you lease, that means something has to be returned. But we'll let him answer that. Because here you see 34 traders are short 35.6% which him and a couple of bankers claim is a hedge. So that comes out to 281 million ounces that these guys are short. But here's my question for Jeff. This is March 2nd. And what he is not answered in his presentation is what you can see if you look at the report from February 2nd, let's see what short position was a month ago. 36.3%. You look at the open interest times 5,000 ounces per contract, 36.3% of that is 326 million ounces of silver. I know some people have asserted that that's a hedge. What I don't understand is that why that increased. It was 292 million ounces. Short position went up 34 million ounces on the COMEX. Although speaking of things that you may want to mention to your lawyer, let's take a listen to this here. Where what happens in the markets ends up influencing what happens with the actual metal in real life. You're saying you don't think that that's a possibility? I mean, you're talking 900 million ounces in the ETF versus a 25 billion ounce market. By the way, the, the, but the those silver billion market... ounces don't move. Now, I'm not quite sure where he gets those numbers from. I've seen estimates of anywhere from two to four billion ounces of above ground silver in investment grade form. He may be including derivatives in there, but a few things to note. Here is SLV data that comes from the iShares own website. You can see January 28th when one day after GameStop, people start talking about silver squeeze. You go from 610 million shares in the trust. And then by February 2nd, day where the price comes down 10%, you have 729 million, which at least my math gets 118 million, 450,000 ounces. Now, Jeff Curry says that's not that big, but if you take that 118 million ounces and then divide it by the 610 of what was there previously, that's 20% trust increased by 20% in those three days right before Jeff Curry went on CNBC as an authorized participant that is expressly forbidden from doing anything with the COMEX future and said a short squeeze is unattainable because it's a small portion. Then here, this is fun. If we take February 2nd minus the 1st, 
represents 61 million ounces. So let's then take 61 divided by, we'll even be generous and use that. So that means on February 2nd, when the price fell 10%, SLV increased the number of shares by 9.19%. And I might add, I called SLV on February 5th to, to verify because I kept talking to other silver experts who said there's no possible way when they look at the supply and demand numbers that these guys could have added that much metal, especially when the price is coming down 10% in a day. And I called iShares on the 5th. It was interesting because they didn't mention any of these prospectus changes that were slipped in in the middle of the night on Wednesday, February 3rd that Jeff Curry didn't mention in his appearance on February 4th, as you can see here, or February 2nd. Look at the background imaging there. Imagine if you're on a trading floor and you don't actually hear the sound, but you just see, wow, silver is getting torched. Here's Jeff Curry using his influence with the Goldman Sachs brand, authorized participant of the trust, but how come in his appearance, he didn't mention anything about the changes to the prospectus on February 3rd, where it said the demand for silver may temporarily exceed available supply. Can we didn't mention that on the 4th when he said a silver squeeze is unattainable. It sounds like they're defining a silver squeeze. It is possible that the authorized participant, that's his bank, Goldman Sachs, may be unable to acquire sufficient silver that is acceptable for delivery to the trust due to a limited then available supply coupled with a surge in demand. And here he is saying that a short squeeze is impossible. But what he didn't mention in his interview is that in such circumstances, the trust may actually suspend or restrict issuance of baskets, which if you go back up here, you find out Guess who gets to decide that? Authorized participants may not be able to readily acquire sufficient amounts of silver necessary for the creation of the basket. And JP Morgan, in addition to being custodian, somehow they're an authorized participant as well. But Goldman's also an authorized participant. So who decides whether silver is available or not? Jeff Curry. And why is he saying that a silver squeeze is unattainable? Did he not see these changes in the documents? You would think that he would have had to have signed off on this, given that he's representing Goldman Sachs Commodity Division as an authorized participant. Did Jeff read these excerpts? To the extent that the aggregate short exposure exceeds the number of shares available for purchase. So the short exposure could be bigger than the number of shares available for purchase. Investors with short exposure may have to pay a premium to repurchase shares for delivery. So I would ask to all of the lawyers that have contacted me and especially the ones that I've already spoken to, as well as anybody who has losses over the past decade, gold or silver, and is still watching everything that we've covered. On what grounds does Jeff Curry say that a short squeeze is unattainable when his bank signed their name to these? and even had the audacity to slip this in and then he didn't say anything. This could lead to volatile price movements in shares that are not directly correlated to the price of silver. That's fraud. It's fraud when you did it on February 2nd, the day before the changes. And it's even more fraudulent when you did it on February 4th, the day after the changes. Whether Jeff Curry ever answers to a jury or a judge that has any integrity, I don't know, but Investors are finding out and that's why you're seeing this unravel. So yes, there are certainly grounds for a lot of legal suits, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, the CFTC. But I personally, this is not legal trading advice. I think it's gonna unravel far before that will ever happen. Look at this, this is interesting. Silver market in general has experienced extreme price and volume fluctuations that have often been unrelated or disproportionate to factors such as silver's use in jewelry. What? Extreme price and volume fluctuations that have often been unrelated to factors such as silver's use, supply and demand, or cost and production levels. The price has often been unrelated. They didn't say it could be unrelated. Look at the tense here. 
Silver market in general has experienced extreme price and volume fluctuations that have often been unrelated. Well, yeah, we saw that. We saw that with the trading records. We didn't see it with Jeff Curry, but we didn't hear anything about it from Ross yet. They're closely monitoring the recent activity in the silver market. We can see how closely they're on it. Here's February 12th, where I took the time to lay it all out. Look how many pages of evidence there are there. There's page five. A lot of evidence. Oh, smoking gun, silver manipulation confirmed. Chris connects the dots. Did their job for him again right there. That's on page seven. Yes, plans to continue submitting evidence. Round two is almost ready. It might have been submitted by the time this gets released. But here's Chairman Benham. He's never spoken about Bart Chilton. He was investigating and hassling the Reddit traders. That sounded like a threat to the way that that was phrased. You know, this is interesting because you can see January 21st, CFTC names Rostin Benham acting chairman. Announced at the commission. This is January 21st. This is two weeks before this happened. That's when they announced this guy. The other guy leaves. They're expressing gratitude to Joe Biden, talking about the work of CFTC is critical to supporting the stability and growth of the American economy. Your agency couldn't have left it more exposed. This guy pops in two weeks before this happens and he's guns blazing with the Reddit traders. Well, if you wanna go pick on people like that, I'm gonna expose you. Is he gonna investigate these changes that Jeff Curry didn't talk about on February 2nd? or February 4th that were slipped into the prospectus that nobody would have noticed if Ronan Manley hadn't done the CFTC's job. Is the CFTC gonna thank Ronan for doing their work again when he found out that SIVR, February 2nd, actually had the <laughs> insanity slip in that online campaign to harm hedge funds and large banks with substantial short exposure to silver. So they're so busy, so focused on slipping midnight language into screw their customers, they didn't even realize they finally acknowledged hedge funds and large banks with substantial short exposure to silver. There you go. So there's no mystery anymore whether there's a short position. And you saw how it manipulatively it's used and you saw these idiots putting in their own damn document and getting caught and sending this weasel out there to lie about it. That's how you pump and dump a market. Throw this in there February 2nd at 4.59 a.m. Slip in a new CFTC commissioner who threatens the victims. Hey, I can't promise you justice in this current legal environment we have, but I'll explain so you know why your money is gone. Anyone who bought silver or gold got clobbered, now you know why. And when you hear people like this guy doing two hour webinars about silver fantasy and fiction, you can be armed with some questions to ask him so that you can get to the truth. And when you hear talk about how it's possible for these banks to be squeezed silver because of position limits, you can ask him why the big banks get to go over the position limits. If anyone actually sits through that and listens to what this man says, let me know if he comments on this. Here's Rick Rule, Sprott Global. We've been able to buy about 30 million ounces of silver. Uh, now, I'm not trying to say it's always been easy, but we've been able to do it. We're probably the largest real physical silver buyer in the world. Uh, and so we get very good service from the market. Uh, but it has actually begun to become difficult for institutions to buy silver. It's Rick Rule talking about the Sprott Trust. I think his credentials speak for itself. I don't know if Jeff mentions any of that in his two-hour presentation. Biggest buyers now having trouble sourcing product, not just coins and bars anymore. And while he seems to be okay with what JP Morgan and some of the other banks do in the markets and get caught doing, I don't know if those are his clients. Maybe that's why he doesn't say anything about that. If you actually do listen to anything he says, Pay attention, because he gives away clues such as this. So if everybody who has open interest takes delivery, the market blows up into faults. 
first off, it doesn't default. It just changes to a cash only uh, settlement or. Just told you all you need to know. Changes to a cash only settlement. I don't know, maybe they will or won't, but Janet Yellen's not slowing down. This is going to end some way or another, regardless of what this man says. If you don't trust him, here's Rick Rule. Market broke. The uh, futures market, the paper silver market, has really driven the physical market, which is to say a great big fat tail has wagged the dog. Uh, to the extent that there are uh, many days now where the futures market trades 200 times the silver on a daily basis of the inventory available for physical delivery. The future market's extremely liquid. It almost never physically settles. It always cash settles. You know, you have hedgers and speculators and everybody else there. But the idea that the physical market uh, is driven by the paper market uh, has always been a bit amusing to me. And the manipulation that's so often described in the silver market, in my experience, mostly takes place with very large participants uh, getting big laddered positions in the futures market, which is extremely liquid and extremely leveraged, <clears throat> and then manipulating the futures market by making on-market transactions in the physicals market that changes the dynamic of the futures market. You'll notice these midnight sales, these large sales of silver into the physicals market. I can't prove that that's manipulation, but why would somebody sell a large amount of silver at a point in time when there were no bids in the market if you weren't trying to deliberately drive the futures pr the, the physical price down in order to uh, profit from positions that you had already established in the futures market? What the young people have done is uh, exposed in very dramatic fashion. The structure of the silver market. Uh, I don't have access to good figures because nobody does. But I suspect if 200 million ounces of silver, or pardon me, if contracts for 200 million ounces of silver were held for physical delivery, which is to say not rolled over for cash, uh, that we would really truly disrupt the silver market. Now, would that break the dam? No, because the dam won't break. Remember that the comics is run for the benefit of the comics, not for you and me. So what would likely happen is that they would change the rules of the game very much like they did the hunts. And they would require 100% margin for short positions or 150% margin. Or if that didn't work, 200% margin. <clears throat> then, uh, and I'm speculating here, they'd halt the market. Uh, and they'd say that we're going to cash settle at market, except for that there wouldn't be any cash in any market to cash settle for. So they would derive an arbitrary market, a negotiated market and cash settle. The idea that you're going to break the comics uh, and break the institutional shorts. And, and by the way, I don't believe that there has been a decade or two decade long uh, conspiracy to manipulate the silver price down. I believe that central bankers talk precious metals down because precious metals is a vote of no confidence in central bankers. I And I definitely know, no, no is the wrong phrase. I definitely believe that from time to time, all financial markets that are leveraged are manipulated by big bank trade desks. I mean, they can they can manipulate markets as large as the US treasury market or the LIBOR market. So in that circumstance, manipulating the silver market is a piece of cake. I don't believe that you are going to break the LME or you are going to break Comex with a short squeeze because they'll change the rules. Keep in mind, he didn't say that a short squeeze can't happen. But someone who's associated with the largest buyer of silver on the planet just told you that the Comex will just change the rules until they weasel out of it. If everybody who has open interest takes delivery, the market blows up and defaults. First off, it doesn't default. It just changes to a cash only uh, settlement or it resolves it in a different way. Or resolves it in a different way? If everybody who has open interest takes delivery, the market blows up and defaults. First off, it doesn't default. It just changes to a cash only uh, settlement or it resolves it in a different way, which the bylaws of the COMEX have always had in the capacity to do. So. Shorts are going to get off the hook because they're going to use a really dirty trick. People like David Morgan have warned about for years because it is in the contract. So that's why sometimes it's good to read the contract when you're playing with banks. 
people who do stuff like this, people who associate with things like that and are okay with it, condone it and say you should look the other way while they look the other way about the evidence. So if you bought gold or silver anytime in the last 20 years, you feel like you've been screwed, you have been. I'm organizing legal options. Certainly I would encourage and applaud anybody else who takes legal action. And again, to be clear, I do not condone or endorse anything that is outside of the law. I don't think it's necessary. These guys are so arrogant that they leave these clues all over. And now you know exactly how. Banks have stolen not once or twice, a couple hundred times, a couple thousand times, but hundreds thousands of times.